service where you can register your Tomcat, JBoss, OpenFire server, and it'll monitor it for you. And you'll receive an email when your server goes offline, which uh, can be a useful thing. Uh, Job Monitor works by collecting all the statistics in the central server, so you don't have to install anything. You don't have to even restart your own server. You don't have to set up your uh, monitoring server, because I've already done that. And uh, you just drop in a little more file into your Tomcat and boom, there you go. This, what you're looking at, is actually a preview of what we're doing. So if you go to the site now, it'll look completely different. But this is the way it will look in a few weeks after we run this. So here you see an overview of a couple of servers, and uh, you can see how they're doing for heat, memory, hibernate things you can dig up. You can share servers between the friends on the forum. So if you're working maybe in a small group, you can look at each other's servers where you can all work together on the same information. So you, you never have to, even if you're in different places in the world, uh, you never have to look at different stats. This is what it looks like, for example, for heat memory. And if you look at the bottom, there's a little link. It's very easy for a job point to just go click and post it on the form and ask a question. So whenever you wonder, is this a normal graph? Should I be worried? You can just ask. And people will ask. And of course, you can receive a little SMS message. If you're really hard at work, and you will be interrupted if one of your servers goes off. And you get another message when it comes back up, so you know how hard to uh, ride your bicycle to get this data so. Anyway, but you, you were here for load testing, for practical information on load testing. Who here has experience with load testing? One, two, three, four. Okay, five. Good. I really like it. One of the things I really like to do is load testing. But I like to do it in an environment where my work is effective. And this you know, if, if I'm just load testing for the hell of it, I don't like doing it, right? So what I'm going to do in this presentation is give you all the things you need to be able to run an effective load test. Also, to decide when not to do it, when to leave it and hand back the assignment. Okay? All right. Um, I like to start. I like to start things with the end in mind. So this is my last slide. This is the practical advice that I'm going to give you. People who see my previous presentation will know their first statement. It's in all my presentations. You need to understand the goal. You need to get commitment from the environment. Everybody needs to work with you rather than against you. Do the math well. We'll go through all of these, not necessarily this one. And uh, I'll help you understand what I mean by all of So let's start with the first. Understanding the goal of the load test. Alright, so this might be a goal. I can't stand here. Is this, is this, in your opinion, is this a good goal for a load test? I see some smiles. Are you there? I mean, you're there, yeah? Okay. So, yes or no? Is this a good definition? I won't hurt you. Fine. <laughs> What can I do? Is this a good, yeah? No, yeah? Okay. I, I don't like it. You know, it's very system oriented. Right? So, how about this one? What do you think? What do you think without me, please? It's better? Yeah, I, I like how it fixed more like how it serves a form of action. Yeah, it has a result. It's also completely wrong. If I sum up all the requests for load tests I've ever had, it comes to this. <laughs> Somebody is worried about something, and there needs to be a load test to prove that that bad something is not going to be happening. How? How do we do this? All right? Notice that the system doesn't actually matter in this. And there is a version of this that I use, it's a bit more insidious, is that somebody is worried that he gets flat. When somebody bad, something bad happens. And it's a person who has money because he has the money to hire a freelancer to talk. That's good. Well, oh, did I say that? So, your job in a typical load test is not about the system, it's about that person who asked you to perform the load test. What is he worried about? That defines the goal because you can come up with all these fixes. 
But if it doesn't match the goal, nobody's going to implement those fixes. So why did you do the load test if people don't implement your fixes? So you need to get that person's commitment. And you get it by serving his or her goal. Okay? So this is typically what happens. They heard something that their new site, they're doing a startup, and they've got this one machine, and they're going to be featured on some Dutch new site. And oh, they're going to have 200 million kids, and oh God. And all hell breaks loose. And they don't know what to do. And then she has gone, oh, yeah, what do you do this? And they don't speak the same language. So the manager gets more worried. It's like, why do I have to do, what? how many I have to scale up? What does that mean? How much does that cost? So he gets worried, 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 and talks to his friends who are also non technical, and they, you know, sort of fuel each other. So by the time you get to talk with that person, he's all over the place, right? They can be a raised right state of mind. So you have to talk to this, and, and that feeling that's beneath it, you have to talk that down to the point where he says, oh, okay, that's good. This I can handle. How do you do that? Right? Are there any managers? Oh no, I, I used to be one. Yeah, I'm one, okay. I'm going to tell a little secret that, that you and I know, nobody else, right? This room is going to know. How many people know this? Manager of math. Right? It's very important. It's one of the most important tools that a manager has. How does it work? Don't tell anyone I'm saying this, yeah? It's a really our secret. Manager of math works different from what you and I learned in school. Manager math is about the size of things, right? So imagine you you want a new laptop. Mine is, you know, it's a, from 2008 or so. It's very old and funky and big. So I want a new powerful machine with the biggest screen, more pixels. So that's about 3,000 euro for what I want. So I go to my boss, and he uses manager math. So he goes 3,000 euro. Not this size, yeah? 3,000 euro? No, sorry, no way. You know. You're not it. That's bad. So then, we go after, he comes in, and he has his new, shiny laptop, you know, MacBook Air, newest version. And you're like, wow, that's so cool. How much did it cost? And he's like, oh, I can. <laughs> Is that how it works? Right? There's more of it. Rounding. So your manager, he can sign, he's authorized to sign to about, you know, 5,000 euros. His friend, he'll make it long. So he'll round those 3,000 euros, he'll round that in his mind. He won't notice because this is an automatic process. He will never register the 3,000. The 3 is insignificant. Who cares about that first little digit? It's about the signs. So he rounds that up to the next power of 10 because that is how they work. And he can't sign for 10k. He only has authority for five. So there's no way he can even sign for that laptop. So he sent you off to write an email that he's going to send to his boss so you can get that special laptop. Right? Now about the 3K, how does that work? Well, he runs that down, obviously, 2,000 euros. And frankly, on the scale of the company, what's that? What's 1,000 euros? So it might as well be nil. So why even have the request form? You can just buy the laptop from Patrick Hatch. Right? So this is management. This is how management thinks. This is how you need to communicate when you're doing load tests, when you want to talk that person down from the panic state to calm assertive, as they say in that popular dog program. So how does that work? How does this conversation go? And this is lunch talk, yeah? This, this takes all of four seconds. So he heard 20, 100 odd million hits. And that's, yeah, that's ridiculous. Come on. It's a Dutch news that there's 16 million people. If all the babies start clicking on the site, we have a different problem than your performance, yeah? So 20k hits is something that's more reasonable. I mean, it's a small news site. It's not even, even the, the, the most popular one. So what are we going to get? 20k hits, but we have that today. But he said, oh, we'll do that. We'll, we'll die. And, you know, I'll look bad. And, uh, I'll be fired. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll take two million. You know, we'll count half the payments. We'll work with two million hits. That's reasonable. And they'll probably agree to that. 
and then you, well, that's over a month. I mean, the, the new site, yeah, they hit you, and then you're on the front page, and then you drop down. So it takes about a month for that traffic to, to reduce the nil. So that's about 100k hits per day. Okay? But yeah, there's a peak at the first day, maybe a week. So, so 500k per day. And then there, well, how many seconds in the day? Lots of them. Notice, manager plan. He doesn't even register that number yet. This is lots. One, three, lots. So there's 10 hits per second, you know. You don't need a calculator for this, you just cross up the zeros. That's why manager math is so powerful. 10 hits per second. And by, you know, the test hardware, it's never the same as it is in production. Today, I'm working for a client, and they actually have a production-like test server. Never seen this. So you know, your test hardware is probably the old stuff, previous production hardware. So, I am going to test for 10 hits. Because 10 hits per second, come on, everybody can have it. And then you know, there's about 7 SQL queries per page, you know, in a, in a reasonable system. That number 7, don't take it from me, you have to check with your own system. I've, today I'm working with a system that has about 100, uh, my own system has about 2. It's all over the place, but you need to know that number. And you can fill it in, and then you can calculate how many hits you have on the database. 100 queries per second, I can do that on my phone. Load test done, and you haven't left lunch yet, you can still finish the bread. Alright? So you need, you know, from that figure, 200 odd million, you have to go, you have to be able to handle what, 100 queries per second on the back end, 10 hits per second on the front end. That's what you're aiming for. If you can hit that, he's going to be happy. Yeah? So where's the system in all this? Right? Alright, so you've done that. And I'm a freelancer, so I usually come into companies, you know, pretty clean. I don't know the company, so I have to look around. How does the company work? Who is important and who's not? This is your typical company with the, the silos operated, operators, DBAs, IT, usually pretty thick walls between them. Right? So this is usually how it works. And as with most companies, influence goes up, budget demands goes down, influence goes up. This is probably, I'm, I'm speaking to a, a mostly Egyptian audience right now. Uh, in Holland, I have to explain, I, I know this from working with Egyptian people in, in the past, as they understand this a lot better. But Dutch people don't actually understand this, yeah? To them this is a big pool. And everybody's a big pool. And it doesn't work like that, but yet they believe it is. Anyway, so, I'll skip this slide. So in reality, what? In reality, it's a bit different. You know, a team manager, he's a dog. Nobody talks to him. Everybody passes it by, even from upper management. Ops is overstaffed. They should have five guys, they got two. They work up to here, and they don't actually actually know Linux very well, the Windows guys that have been forced into it. And the DBAs might as well not be there. They're in a different floor, imagine that. You can't even see them. So you don't hear about them, they've got this thick wall about them. And there you come. So where do you live? This is the best place to be, honestly. <laughs> you know, if only. Come on. You need to be with that person because at the end of the day, man, dead budget, he has it all. No need for influence, no need for nothing. You can just say, I want this, and he goes, oh yeah, I'll get it. Alright? <coughs> if you get stuck with an IT manager, you've got a problem. You're left to go to. <laughs> it's not familiar, no, no, no. no. Alright, so if you're stuck with that IT manager, Yes, you hand in your assignment and go, oh, thank you, sorry, man. Because that guy has no, nothing in this company whatsoever. No amount of mandate will make IT move. No amount of influence will make that manage up down. So you're stuck. So you can do it for the hours, but not for the result. All right? This is probably the second best place to be. Because this guy, he's in a good place. People listen to him. That's probably where you want to be. In this example, yeah. If you go with the EBA, well, might as well not be there. All right. 
so what's next? Next is that you need to lay out so preparation skill, yeah? You're an engineer, you want to get to load testing. Don't make that mistake. Load testing isn't technical, it's not a technical problem. Okay, it's a business problem. It is a person, people problem. One of the problems I have is I'm an engineer, so I'm a really bad negotiator. If somebody comes up with a good, good argument, I go, oh yeah, I think you're right, then I agree. That's, that's just who I am. And most engineers, they want to deal with systems, so if somebody comes up and starts talking about things, they just like to agree because they want that person to go away. Because they want to do system stuff. So how, as an engineer, do I make sure that in most negotiations, I don't pull the short stick? Because otherwise, I'll get vague promises, and I won't be able to change anything. I won't be able to do anything. So the trick I use is I measure commitment in man hours. So you get big stories about how, many, how committed they are to your work, and how well you're doing it, and then you ask, and maybe you should rephrase the question is, all right, so this commitment that you're giving, how many man hours is it? Write that down, please. Not verbally, I want it written. Because a promise isn't a promise until it's written down, and you can put his name on it. Okay? I've had lots of promises. If I got everything I was promised, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be running this place. But no, I'm standing here again. Yeah. So commitment is measured in man hours and in written man hours, to should be. That is the key. In, in any company, man hours, is that true in Egypt? In Holland, in, in any company, man hours is the currency. Money is irrelevant. Man hours. It all translates to man. So if you're doing the negotiation, you come out at the end of it and you look at what was the commitment in my house that was on paper promised to me. And even then, they'll come back and say, well, things have changed. And you think, okay, I'll end it. What else do you need? I mean, this is shopping list work, yeah? So this is all, you try to do this on the first day. This is the day that you're there, you're not paid yet, you're trying to figure out where you are. Version code. Most systems have version code, okay? I'm glad to say, as soon as you get into sort of the more webby areas of PHP, you need to start worrying, this is something you need to check. For Java, for, Java, for uh, uh, C, for the math, it's usually this, this old version, but as soon as you get into the more flexible languages, the versioning also gets a lot more flexible. Okay? So you need to check. Do they have version code? And does their system allow some form of branching? And if branching isn't mandatory, but it's extremely helpful. And I don't like branching. Let me get this clear. I don't like the, oh, we've got four versions of this code in production by branching. I like the, we're branching on Monday, merging on Tuesday. That's the type of branching I like. Okay? And if your versioning system helps you with that, that's good, and it makes it easier. We'll get to that later. Version system configuration. Now, why would I ask that? Version, because I'm asking something that doesn't actually happen anyway. Nobody versions their system. Who does? Who versions their system configuration? And yes, I'm not lying, I do this. I've got, I run FreeBSD. I've got all the important configuration files of my system in Subversion. And I can tell you, Subversion is a terrible tool to do this in. But my god, it's the only thing I have. Right? Look at Puppet, look at Chef. Those are things that allow you to version your systems. And it'll save you so many headaches. So I, I could, uh, I'll not do it, but I could do a talk just on that subject. I'm sure people will. Operating system configuration. Yes, it needs to be versioned. If somebody tunes a cache on machine A that needs to be rolled to machine B and person C needs to know about this, how will they know? Yeah, we'll send an email and tell him not to forget. <sighs> application server configuration. One of the things I hate about most application servers, they've got this GUI where you go click a configuration. And I've seen people do this in WebSphere, open up the tested production machines in 
two different browsers and check all the tabs to see all the data is the same. This was 2010. Can you believe this? You write all the configuration into a single file. You put that file into SVN. I'll tell you even different for systems that I give to clients. Tomcat is in subversion with the code. You do an SVN checkout, you run the SCART script, and that's it. There is no separate application service. It's all in one piece. Okay, so system configuration and, and application uh, server configuration always need to be versioned. If they're not, well, that just means that your hours have to go up. Right? Because you'll be fighting system administrators who forgot stuff. Uh, application server ad, uh, uh, admins go down actually now have that server. And you need this. And you need to check with the person you're talking to. How many times a day am I allowed to deploy a new version? It's a very interesting question. And when the answer is, well, once a month, you're done, because you can't work. If the answer is, it's all automated, so do whatever you like, you're in business, yeah? But the answer is going to be, oh, I need to ask the guys. And they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're still working on that automation script, but I, I didn't get around to it. Okay, first order of your load test, make automated deploy. Next slide. More shopping lists. So what are you going to test it with? How are you going to ensure that you've got a production data, a production-like data set? And if this is a financial system, or maybe it's a police system, I've worked with those. So the test that is it a copy of production? That's interesting because that means that if there is a fraud case, suddenly my name is on the list of people who have access to that information. I don't think so. I'm not insured that well. So that test data needs to be representative of the production data in some way, but it cannot be production data depending on the system. I mean, if it's Twitter, yeah, whatever, give me the production data, okay. But if it's financial or privacy, don't touch data. Personnel files, don't touch the data. And I'm doing it today. Today I'm working for a financial institution. I try not to look at the numbers because it's all there. My account might be coming up in an exception. We're not waiting for that day. And there are lots of problems with test data that are more technical. Like there's some well, technical. Um, the, uh, for example, what I do now is I load as Java monitor, so I generate uh, a lot of uh, users that posts that are all simulated. But the problem is, all of these posts end up in one account. So my primary, no, sorry, my index on the database don't actually work. Because the distribution of hosts that are sending data and the hosts that are not sending data is completely off. Usually about half the hosts are sending data, half are not, give or take. But in this case, during the load test, all the hosts are sending data. So suddenly my SQL queries get slow, because the index that's there doesn't work because it doesn't actually make a difference. <sighs> so how am I going to translate that back to that problem, the, the 200,000 million hits? And then if the end of the day, for all engineers, the problem is humans. So I'm working now with a system where documents come in and they get processed and at some point a human has to look at some of them and then they proceed for more processing. How exactly are we going to simulate 300 people doing people things, you know, non-deterministic, in non-deterministic time, drinking coffee, spilling stuff over keyboards? How am I going to fake that? Good luck. I don't know. What we do now is we've got a little script that pretends to be a human. But due to the fact that we only have two machines that we can actually run this stuff on, well, they work as if they are superhuman. So they never have any wait time between getting the data and giving the answer. Which means that those two machines are simulating 40 superhumans rather than 300 normal humans. So the effect is that my data set that usually 
sort of evenly distributed. So I've got a couple of documents in the pre-human <laughs> stage, I've got a couple of documents, a couple being, you know, 200,000. Um, in the post-human stage, these humans are so fast that I've got no documents in the pre-human stage, and all of them are in the post-human stage. So my load test is actually testing the second part of the system and not the first part. Because all the documents, as soon as they hit the system, go foo, and they're in the second part. So we switch off that scrim and then start it again. You know, a lot of manual labor involved. And it doesn't make for very good tests. Humans are terrible machine -owned. So I think the message of the past two slides was don't try to replicate production unless you can, unless it's easy, right? But usually what I do is I try to get as close as I can and then I bring back the manager math because it helps me here as well. Right, so this system has 46 cores, this one has 8. Um, but this is a new machine, that's an old box. So, it can probably handle three times the production, the, the test load. So, but my data distribution is different, so um, whatever happens on test, I can handle twice that on production. Right? And the important part is here, how much confidence do you have? How much confidence do you say this way? Remember the goal, what you're there for. That person needs to calm down, stop bothering his team, allow them to do that work. Your job is to put his mind at ease. So being able to be confident no matter what is important. Being able to do this without blinking is important. And what's the worst you're going to do? Fire me on a contract. So what you do is you, you determine sort of a test to life ratio, you're going to say, and you, you bring in all the factors that you can think of in that conversation, and then you use manager math to explain that. I'm in the business of monitoring systems, so I tend to talk about this something a lot. So you're doing a low test, we're now, interesting, switch. We've now switched from the preparation of the load test to the actual load test, right? I'm on slide 38 or 47, right? So three quarters of my slides are about preparation. And the load test is the fun part, but it's not the most important part. So you're doing a load test, and the system will break. You know, that's, that's the whole point. You, you're going to break the system. So, how will you know? And think about fixing the identified bottlenecks, think about identifying the bottlenecks. How precisely are you going to do that? So maybe, I said switch into actually load testing. Wait, maybe there's one more thing we have to do in preparation, which is monitor your system. You need to set up some way to be able to look at that machine and say, yes, it's operating beautifully, or no, it's not. And here's where it breaks. How do you do this? It's very simple. You install any monitoring system. Obviously I'm biased, so Java Monitor is the perfect candidate, but there are hundreds of these. And it's all open source. You literally drag it in from the internet, install it, it works, and they're all beautiful. And some have features, some have uh, no features. Look at them, install any of them, and start monitoring. Okay? What do you look at? You look at CPU, disk I.O., network I.O., number of documents processed, Number of use cases handled, number of requests. Anything that can help you identify bottlenecks in the system. I'll do a bit more on that later. But the most important point is you need to be able to see the whole system. And if you go to a place where I was, that I wasn't contracted, uh, and they say, look, um, yeah, you, you can't actually monitor the system because per metric you have to pay HP a certain amount, and that's so much we don't have budget for. Right, so you're deliberately blindfolding yourself during a load test? Alright, so why exactly did you ask me in here? Because, you know, we don't need to be talking. You need to be talking to HP. And after that, you can come back to me, because I'm not working blindfolded. I said, well, maybe I can install my own monitoring system. No, 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 no. You can't touch it, because that's the operation.
Generation to come. Whatever. Thank you. It was a good conversation, but it never resulted in a contract. Imagine why. So you need to have a monitoring system. And uh, I think, personally, as a developer, you always need to have something. You always need to be able to say, with confidence, hey, my system is using this much memory. My system is using this much I.O. Our bottleneck is I.O., is memory, is number of file scripts. You need to be able to say that. Yeah? It means you need to understand your system. And when you do, don't just